In this video, I'm going to be talking about the polyphonic orchestral texture from George Frederick McKay's book, Creative Orchestration. In that book, he outlines eight distinct orchestral textures. I made a video where I introduced the concept from the book, and I'm making a distinct video for each of the textures where we look at what the texture is, listen to an example, and I'm taking the Breath of the Wild theme and arranging it in the style of that texture to see how it can be used. Please make sure you subscribe so you can catch when the other videos are ready to go. So the polyphonic texture is what we think of as maybe traditional counterpoint. So if you ever listen to a fugue or an invention, it's that idea of many independent lines working together, kind of creating a fabric. So the independent lines all doing their own thing kind of counterintuitively actually blend together. They lose their distinct independent voice to create the overall whole. So the way the polyphonic texture is different than maybe the heterophonic or what we're gonna look at is one called the polythematic is that they should be functioning together. So usually you'll be having sounds that are very similar. So just in the woodwinds or just in the strings uh, because you don't want too much distinction between the different parts. Them kind of meshing together into a unified whole is part of the point. So there are a lot of examples in the classical repertoire of the polyphonic texture. Any fugue arranged for the orchestra will do that. So I decided to choose something a little more contemporary. This is Anakin's theme from The Phantom Menace by John Williams. And this is the B section to the theme where he's using the polyphonic texture to contrast uh, what we had before in the A section. I will say that unlike what I was just describing with a fugue, he's still putting a lot of emphasis on the melody. And I think that for us in 2021, that's a little more realistic of how we would be using this texture in our own writing as well. Uh, I think the top line or the melody line is something that we generally tend to write around more. Uh, so I thought this was a good example that it feels like the polyphonic texture but there is still some emphasis on the melody. So if we look here, we can see the melody is definitely the busiest line uh, in the violins and the highest pitch. So it's clearly gonna stand out to us. But what really partly gives away that this is a polyphonic texture is that the four main voices in the violin one, violin two, viola, cello, all start on a different beat. So they all have a different moment to introduce, and that really helps you feel each one enter separately. In the playback by Sibelius, maybe the cello and the viola won't sound that different, but in the presence of a real orchestra where everybody's sitting in a different place, you will feel each section, even just in a moment, kind of having their moment to start speaking. And that will give that impression of some independence but they're all in the string orchestra. They have very similar timbres. So there is gonna be this more of just kind of a fabric of a you know unified sound going on. But also notice that each voice going in has some distinct flavor to it. So the melody here is roughly staying around the same place of this fourth uh, and it's going up a third, going down a fourth, whereas the cello line is clearly descending down through the octave from the C down all the way to this G, to the G flat. So uh, there is some separation there, even from the top and bottom lines. And then the middle lines here, there's some passing tones. There are a couple moments, they are simpler lines because their duty is in a lot of ways to handle the missing chord tones that we need in the middle, uh, but they still do have some phrasing and they do still have a chance to have some melody. Um, I do wanna emphasize here this double bass part which is only working here on the cadence. And that's really important. John Williams does this really well. Uh, we've seen this example with the Scheherazade and the uh, Nutcracker already as well, that these moments of beginning or these moments of end are really important and really special to add just a little extra oomph for a little subtlety. So saving the double bass just for that cadence here, which he does a lot throughout this whole piece, adds some importance and weight to that cadence and helps us really feel like that's a structural moment and feel the significance of the pause and the rest there. Also see that for the only time in this four bar phrase, he also uses that cadence to punch with the woodwinds, those chords, and have a little harp fill. And it's really pretty subtle. Uh, it's one of those things that's again, kind of felt more than you maybe even realize it or hear it. But again, it gives some power to the cadence. It makes the cadence special, uh, whereas if we had just the clarinets and bassoon holding those chord tones the whole time, we would lose that. We would lose the extra unique punch that the cadence is given here. So let's take a listen to this. Mm -hmm. 
So what I really want you to hear is the richness and lushness in those strings, that it feels very full and flowing and moving. You know, it's not just like the violin has chord tones being held underneath it. Every string part below it has something to say, has, as a player, has something to play and has some phrasing to it. It feels like a line. I mean, even if we just listen to these lower lines without the melody, we can hear that they all have some interesting parts to play. So let's see if we can apply a similar concept to the Breath of the Wild theme. Uh, find a way to add some counter lines and some polyphonic texture to make this sound very rich. I'm gonna do the same thing, I think, and use strings uh, because I think that was working really well on the other part. So let's start by adding in the string instruments. And then I'm gonna copy this up to the violins and we'll keep that in the top voice. Let's add some bowing. So in a traditional kind of counterpoint writing context, you might not be coming in with these chord symbols, especially maybe these kind of jazzy chord symbols already given to you. So when that's the case, when I already have chord symbols, I'm gonna be a little more conscious of finding those missing chord tones. I might even in this case, maybe start with, you know, what are the chord tones underneath and then how can I carve some lines out of it? I wanna start on the bottom with the cello and I'm thinking of introducing the cello right here because that is the first gap and that's a way for it to be heard. So when we have, I might even bring the violin one down an octave too, but let's see. And we wanna end up somewhere on the A flat, maybe even on the A flat. That will be a good start. So what's nice there is we're starting on a chord tone, which is nice. That G creates a third with the B flat, which would be nice. We got contrary motion. All that as a start will be pretty good. Let's have everybody be kind of quiet. Then we can look at what's side do I want to fill in. Let's work on um, just the chord, just the, I was thinking about, do I want to fill in these inner voices now or do them later? I want to go a little further, at least to the end of this first four bar phrase with just you, um, with just you, with just the cello. And then we'll fill in those voices ever. So we could have, I think I might do that echoing that line. And then maybe just get from this F down there. That would probably be enough. So our outer voices on these first four bars. Now let's fill in who's missing. No, that's a little too close to the cello. E flat is not missing, the G is definitely missing. So let's emphasize. Maybe we can do that. Okay. 
Jones. Got an E flat on you somewhere. All right, let's see, where are we gonna end up here? That's what's on top. Yeah, somewhere. You might wanna be somewhere around here. Oops, just trying to hear it. So we end up emphasizing that. So I'm gonna want you in this range. I'm gonna want you in this range. And then can we add something a little more interesting? I'll deal with you, Mr. Viola, at some point. That might just work. Maybe we could even do what would that be like? Where that guy's real small. Alright, and now the next phrase. Let's give a little more respect to maybe Viola friend here. Well, since this is so high, let's think about where we might want to end up. Maybe you'll want to be Come on. So much more should I count? Cool. That will work. We're going to emphasize that guy down there. We're going to want to end up making sure we get the sus. So that will probably come in there, but we don't want it on that. Uh, 
I'm gonna end up somewhere around there. Oh, duh. Maybe we'll put a D on that. That might work. Let's listen to the whole thing here now. It's pretty good. There are moments where I might want to go in with a fine tooth comb. I'm sure there's a couple little clashing intervals and a couple moments where we could make other parts more interesting. I kind of left this blank here on purpose just so that cello line could be heard, um, but then the cello got a little basic going forward. Um, but you know, we were coming from a melody that's already pretty active on the top. Uh, like we we're saying, unlike a fugue where every voice has kind of equal importance. In a more modern, actual use of the polyphonic texture, uh, the melody is still king and everybody else is going to be serving to that role um, in a different way. That is a general idea of how you can use the polyphonic texture in an orchestral setting. And again, notice the emphasis on keeping the timbres pretty similar. These are all on the strings, which is partly just because it's very lush and rich sounding, but also it makes it that feeling of a fabric where all the different voices feel very close together as a family and there is a sense of unification throughout it. So that is my example of the polyphonic orchestral texture. For videos about the other seven orchestral textures that maybe already exist or I'm still working on, please subscribe and you'll know when those are out. I'll see you next time.